I am delighted to be joined today by Nina Harrison, who is an associate at Owen Mitchell, and with whom I very recently did a case on Montreal Convention, which is something of a game changer um, in all modesty in relation to uh, Montreal Convention and contributory negligence. So Nina has been brought in uh, to do the difficult stuff and the recent law stuff, whilst I am here to do the um, general chapter and what Nina would refer to as babble. Um, <laughs> so that is how we intend um, to uh, to divide uh, this up. We're going to talk a little bit about general rules of interpretation of the Montreal Convention. Um, some of those rules, in fact, I think all of them, should be drawn across to the Athens Convention um, on Accidents at Sea as well, because we are talking about international treaties, so that's quite useful. Um, we'll talk a little bit about scope. Um, somebody asked a question about the scope of the convention when it applies to embarkation and disembarkation. We'll talk a bit about bodily injury because there's been some recent case law on that. Um, and then we'll go on to talk about the meaning of accidents because that has been uh, developing over time. And then we'll talk a bit about the Wickner case um, that we were involved in and a little bit about turbulence because that obviously is in the news uh, at the moment. We'll start um, with a slide which Nina was very keen to put in. Um, in relation to limitation. And again, if you've ever been to one of my decanals on, on either Athens or Montreal, you will be familiar with this slide, um, but you're going to get it from a different person now. So Nina. Thank you, Sarah. You've also just promoted me because I'm not an associate, but thank you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> but thank you anyway. And hello to everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, this is obviously a fairly straightforward slide but I think it's an important point to state and I'm sure you're all aware of it but the limitation period under the convention is two years and that's from the date of arrival at the destination or from the date on which the aircraft ought to have arrived or from the date on which the carriage stopped so it's two years. Sorry you slide thank you. Um, also, the cause of action, which we are going to talk about more today, and the word accident in Article 17.1. So, Article 17.1 says that the carrier is liable for damage sustained in case of death or bodily injury of a passenger upon condition, only that the accident which caused the death or injury took place on board the aircraft or in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking. So Sarah will say more on this in just a moment. We often get questions about embarking, disembarking, where it begins, where it ends. It's a bit of a grey area. So we are going to cover this, but there's just first a couple of general points with regards to interpretation. And these general rules of interpretation were addressed in the recent judgment of Wuckner by his honour Judge Saunders. And essentially... It was stated that the convention should be construed uniformly and that's how it's interpreted. So the courts can seek assistance from relevant decisions from other convention countries. International and domestic authorities are both relevant, as are cases under the Warsaw Convention. But the important thing is that the court has to look at the language of the convention and apply it to the specific case. So for example, there's no definition of negligence in the convention. And so national courts have to interpret the terms of negligence and wrong act or omission accordingly. So the convention aims to strike this balance between the interests of airlines and passengers. And the court can't just change that because it takes a view on fairness. And I think Sarah is going to talk about scope. Yeah, I mean, I just, before we, before I go on to move, actually, I moved my slide on um, foolishly because actually I just wanted to uh, jump in on that a bit and to say that in Wuckner, I was trying to commit, because we were for claim in Wuckner, I was trying to convince the judge that there was some kind of consumer protection spin to the convention because um, it was brought into force um, here most recently um, by European legislation and that's quite consumer friendly. Um, he was having none of that, rightly so, um, because the convention does just strike a balance. It's not consumer protection. It's not um, commercial protection. It's drawing a balance between the two, you know, between the the, um, the passenger and the airline. 
Um, and because that's the case, it means that you can look at the travel preparatoire to the convention. So you can look at the minutes of all the meetings that took place before the convention um, was finalised. But actually, they've drawn the balance that they have drawn um, and the court cannot do anything about that. So unlike with some European consumer legislation, for example, past travel regulations, the courts can't say, well, we're going in the direction of consumer protection and therefore we're going to um, interpret the convention in a protective kind of way. It's just not open to the court to do that. And actually going back to the cause of action um, and, and the limitation point that Nina's just importantly made, it's important to bear in mind that when the convention applies, you only have a two year limitation period, whereas otherwise you would have a three year extendable limitation period. Now, in some cases, that's going to mean that the application of the convention is, is um, a good thing for a passenger. And in other cases, it's going to be a bad thing for a passenger because you've only got two years, which is a bad thing for claimants. But on the other hand, there's a form of strict liability, which is a good thing for claimants. So that's the balance that they have struck. So sometimes claimants are going to want to bring themselves within the convention because there's strict liability but in a limited way. But in other cases, the claimants are going to bring themselves or want to bring themselves outside the convention because they're trying to bring a claim two and a half years after the date of the accident. So it's not one of those cases where you can intuit the answer. You can't say, well, you know, I've got a claimant friendly judge, therefore X is going to happen because the convention just doesn't really work like that. And the rules of interpretation that Nina's just taken us through um, show that, you know, you're looking at a uniform um, macro sort of convention is international. You're looking at something, you're looking at authorities that come from all over the world. Um, you know, some given greater weight than others. So, for example, the American authorities are given greater weight than the Canadian authorities, too. Um, but they all, all the authorities internationally from all the countries that are signatories to the convention should say the same thing. Whether or not they do is maybe debatable, particularly now that European Union um, has started to, to get active in this regard. Um, got a question. Excellent. Can airlines successfully assert an Article 21 to defence these days? Ah, I will be answering that later. So hold that thought. I will come on to that. Um, for the moment, we were asked a question about scope. So that question relates to looking at the cause of action. Um, the convention applies where the accident took place on board the aircraft or in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking. So the question is, what does that mean? Where does the convention start um, kicking in effectively? So when you first get to your um, to your airport, you want to go on a, a flight to, let us say, Austria. When you first get to the airport, you are within the purview of the airport operator and any cause of action that you may have in relation to accidents um, due to the state of the premises is going to have to be brought under the Occupiers Liability Act. There comes a point in the airport, though, that you pass through that, the Occupiers Liability Act ceases to apply, and the convention will apply. And the convention starts applying once you are in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking. And the question that we were asked is, well, where's the line? Where's the line? Ideally, you would have an actual line in the airport, and once you get over it, the red line... Um, then you're going to be subject to the convention and the convention is going to apply. Um, that's not what happens, though, as a result of the wording of the convention, because it talks about the operations of embarking or disembarking. And various theories have been um, put forward over the years in the case law, and it is not entirely consistent. So there's a control theory which says that when you come within the control of the carrier, then the convention starts to apply. And the reason for that is that the convention applies and um, imposes liability on the carrier itself, so it's non-delegable. And therefore, the theory says, well, if you're going to impose liability on the carrier, the carrier ought to have some control over what is happening to you. It no ought not to be the case that the carrier is liable for something it's got no control over. Now, that's an attractive theory, but actually, it doesn't really gel with the rest of what happens under the convention. 
Because, for example, the carrier is going to be liable, as we'll see later, for criminal acts by people who they have no control over. So the control theory, to my mind, doesn't really hold together in a, a sort of ideological kind of way. So there's then the place of safety theory, which is that once you've disembarked from a flight and you're in a place of safety in the airport, so you've come out of the disembarkation, um, you've come through, say, passport control, and you've reached a place of safety which is analogous to any other part of the country, or if you look at it from an embarkation point of view, you've gone into the airport and you're still under sort of English rules, for example, if you're in England, um, then that then that would not be within the scope of embarkation, disembarkation. It's a nice theory too. I don't think it really works because you're still going to be under kind of English rules or English customs, even once you've started embarking, it seems to me, if you're in England. So that I don't I don't love. There's an operations of embarking or disembarking um, theory. And that is, I think, the theory that makes the most ideological sense. So that comes from the language of Article 17. So if you are either on board, that's really easy, or in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking, then the convention applies. And that suggests that if you're doing something that gets you closer to being on the aircraft. So for example, if you're presenting your passport, if you're presenting a boarding pass, then you're going to be doing an operation of embarking or disembarking because you're doing something you have to do in order to embark or disembark. So you're going up the steps to the aircraft, you're coming down the steps from the aircraft, you're going across um, one of those bridges, um, you're putting in your boarding pass. The problem with that theory, though, like any theory, there's always problems with it. The problem with that theory is that you can be doing an operation of embarking. So you can be, for example, you can put your passport forward or you can um, show your boarding card and then you stop doing one. So there's no, there is no bright line. There is no red line in the airport because I've shown my boarding pass and then I go wandering off to buy a cup of coffee, for example. While I'm doing that, buying the cup of coffee, I'm not in one of the operations of embarking and disembarking. When I come back from getting my coffee and I rush towards getting my flight, I am in one of the operations of embarking. And intellectually, it's quite you slightly struggle with the idea that I can be going, I can be walking over the same area of the airport. And in one case, because I'm going to get a coffee, um, the convention doesn't apply. And in the other case, because I'm going towards the boarding gate, the convention does apply. So that's the issue with that theory. But I don't think we've ever satisfactorily worked out which of those theories um, we're going to be we're, we're going to be looking at. Um, Peter Neenan said, can I have a copy of the judgment? Yes, you can. We can send you all a copy of the judgment if you would like it um, with together with the links. So um, we will do that. Um, but I think in answer to the person who talked about the scope of the convention, I'm afraid the jury is still out. And it's a very barristerial answer, isn't it, that it depends. But um, you argue whichever of these theories is most advantageous to you because there's case law that supports each and every one of them. I personally think that the third one is most consonant with the convention. Um, and even if it does, uh, does um, lead to some um, difficulties, they all do. And actually, as we will see with the convention, um, the various um, interpretations of various parts of it all lead to problems of one kind or another further down the line. And the reason for that, I think, is that it's attempting to deal with lots of different accidents and lots of different situations um, in, a, in a sort of umbrella kind of way. And it doesn't necessarily work particularly well for all of them. But that's the that's the scope of it. It's going to depend. And you'll get a lot of that, I'm afraid, as, as we go on. So death or bodily injury, there has to be a death or bodily injury, as you will recall um, from seeing uh, the wording of it. So the carrier is liable for damage sustained in case of death or bodily injury on condition only the accident takes place during the course of the convention scope. So it's talking about bodily injury. The question for the courts, um, and it has vexed the courts greatly, is whether or not bodily injury is going to include psychological injury. Let me just say I've got another question. Uh, could you differentiate between actions you have to do to embark on a flight, or on any flight, 
and those required to get the particular flight. So you give your passport in in the same way for any flight. That is true, Will, you do. But looking at the wording, you can see in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking. So the argument would be that is an operation. Something you have to do for any flight is one of the operations that you have to undertake to embark any flight. Now, that would be different to the place of safety argument. So it depends which theory you use. Um, I personally would say it is an operation of embarking or, or disembarking any flight. So moving on, unless there's any questions um, about that. Um, death or bodily injury, you'll all be aware, of course, of the Morrison, KLM, King and Bristow um, judgments. This is the House of Lords, um, UK House of Lords saying psychological injury may come within bodily injury. So could be compensable under the convention if if an injury to the brain of a passenger is found to have occurred. So the claimant would need to show evidence that there has been some bodily injury, some injury that would be picked up, for example, an MRI scan or something of that nature, um, that would show a difference in the, the operation of your brain as a result of the accident. And that could include a psychological injury because we know on testing and scanning that um, people with PTSD, for example, different parts of their brain light up and so on. But that is very much kind of at the cutting edge of the science of it. In Doe and Etihad, um, this is an American case, Claim was pricked by a hypodermic needle, developed psychological injuries. So you've got a very de minimis um, bodily injury, but you have got a psychological injury. Now, in Doe and Etihad, the American court held the carrier is liable to damage sustained in case of bodily injury on condition only the accident uh, takes place in the aircraft. So because the, the convention used the words in case of rather than caused by, that means that where there is a bodily injury as well as a psychological injury, you can recover for both. So we had thought that following Morris and KLM, that you can only recover for psychological injury where that has been caused by some physical change to your body, because there's a distinction between bodily and psychological injury. Doe and Etihad suggests that you can recover in relation to psychological injury where there has been a physical injury as well. So it doesn't have to be caused by the physical injury. We'll go back to the um, wording of the underlying cause of action. Carrier is liable for damage sustained in case of death or bodily injury. So once you've got a bodily injury of whatever kind, even de minimis, even a pinprick, you can recover for your psychological injury. And that was the state of the American um, authorities. So the conclusion you draw is that if there is any body, bodily injury, just a pinprick, that's all it has to be, on board the aircraft as a result of an accident, you can recover a psychological injury that goes far beyond that, as long as there's been a bodily injury. Now, in Delaney, and this is a Scottish case, um, the claim settled. This is a bus crash, and there were psychological and physical injuries. And the court doesn't actually determine whether the claimant is able to recover for psychological injuries. But it's indicative because it looks at whether the cost of taking a, uh, obtaining a report from a psychiatrist is recoverable or not. And if, of course, no psychiatric injury would be recoverable, the claimant wouldn't be able to recover the cost of getting a cost of a psychiatrist. So in determining that question, the court said, yes, you can recover the costs of obtaining a psychiatrist report because it can't be stated with certainty that she never had a claim for psychiatric injury. And there is, it seems, um, in Scotland, what they call a colourable argument that the Montreal Convention is more amenable to being able to, to get damages for psychiatric injury than the Warsaw Convention. Now, I'm not sure I know what a colourable argument is, whether it's a good argument or a not good argument, um, or whether there's an arguable case there. But certainly Delaney seems to be quite encouraging that Montreal might allow for recovery for psychiatric injury in cases where the Warsaw Convention would not have done. Um, 
I find Delaney a bit difficult to understand myself. Um, it's only a cost case. Um, and it probably doesn't matter now um, because of the BT and order motion um, case. This is a case from the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, I don't love it, honestly. Um, it's not binding on us, but it is binding in the same way that any other case under the convention is, because you'll recall Nina saying that international and domestic cases um, are all um, uh, are, are all things that you look to in interpretation. I'm just going to answer a question, Victoria Roy. Um, one of my thoughts on psychiatric injury being recoverable following sexual molestation when no bodily injury, but there is unlawful touching. Well, I think an unlawful touching is something that you could probably argue should come within a bodily injury um, type situation because it's an unlawful touching is a battery. So if you want to be technical about it, I think... Um, although there's no injury to the person as such, there is an injury to the invasion of their personal space. But your um, Australian, if I recall, so your Australian case law might give you um, an answer to that. But yeah, it's a really good question that. But actually, following BT and law motion, it may not matter because the courts of justice there um, looked at someone who had PTSD. So... This is the, you see the facts on the, on the slide. It's the left engine exploded during takeoff. Passengers were evacuated. Uh, claimant hurled um, by a jet blast and diagnosed with PTSD. So the questions the CJU had to answer looked at, does the psychological impairment of a passenger caused by an accident and with clinical significance constitute a bodily injury? So they're looking at psychological impairment only. And the Court of Justice there held that the carrier can be liable only, the aggrieved passenger only needs to show by means of a medical report and proof of medical treatment an adverse effect on psychological integrity. So if you show an accident and you get a medical report that shows um, some psychological trauma, and it has to be of such gravity or intensity such that it affects general state of health and it can't be resolved without medical treatment, then you can recover damages. So, Victoria, your answer would be under BC and Lauder motion, yes, you can, because all you've got to show by reference to medical evidence is that there is um, some psychological injury which can't be resolved without medical treatment. Now, I personally have a lot of problems with this case. Um, one of them is that the Court of Justice has got no business telling us how you prove things because it's not within their remit. So these are procedural matters. The convention doesn't refer to medical reports, doesn't refer to proof of medical treatment. Um, in the English courts, you might or might not need to prove your psychological injury by reference to a medical report and or medical treatment. So that's the first problem I have with the, the decision, that there's no reference in the convention whatsoever that there must be a medical report or there must be proof of medical treatment. Um, they don't address the issue of bodily injury at all and the issues with that. They don't adequately address the other international case law that looks at this at all. Um, and the other problem that there is, is that they say that the psychological injury has to be of a particular gravity. So it has to be of such gravity or intensity it affects his or her general state of health. So much so that it can't be resolved without medical treatment. Now, in the English courts, you don't need to prove that, generally speaking, in relation to psychological damage. But it seems, if we were to follow BT, that in Montreal, Montreal Convention cases, they are a particular kind of case where you've got to show, by reference to a medical report, that the claimant requires medical treatment. And if you do show that, then you recover. I think that's just simply wrong, actually. Um, the, the English courts um, have not been asked to follow it um, in any reported cases. I don't think they would. And the reason I don't think they would follow it is that it reads into the convention words that aren't there. It applies a standard of proof or, or a, an evidential standard of proof that isn't there. And it also applies a gravity of injury that, that isn't there either. 
Um, on the other hand, it does allow the claimant to recover from psychological injury. So, you know, the court in doing the claimant a favour and saying, yes, you can recover from psychological injury when we all thought you couldn't because it had to be bodily injury, um, has also imposed these um, barriers to recovery, um, which would not have been there in, for example, Doe and Etihad or in Delaney. So it's a slightly odd um, decision. And as I say, I don't think it's right. Um, but, you know, what do I know? We will we will discover, no doubt, whether the English courts will be inclined to follow it or not. Now, I've got another number of questions. So bear with me whilst I just have a look and check whether they are relating to um, Article uh, 21 or uh, later. Uh, answer that. So that's... So, got a, a comment from Peter Neenan. In the travel preparatoire, when presenting the final draft convention back to the conference, the claimant included a draft statement by the conference, stating one with reference to Article 16, Paragraph 1 of the convention, the expression bodily injury is included on the basis of the fact that in some states, damages for mentally, mental injuries are recoverable under certain circumstances. The jurisprudence in this area is developing and that it's not intended to interfere with this development, having regard to jurisprudence in areas of an international carriage by air. Isn't the suggestion of needing evidence of gravi uh, or gravity just certain circumstances? So effectively, what, what Peter is saying is, well, it was intended um, that the convention would develop some nations that are signatories um, to the convention require certain kinds of evidence to get home on psychological injury. And it shouldn't, the, the convention is not supposed to interfere with that. Therefore, can't you defend this decision on the basis that we are developing um, jurisprudence in various nations um, and that some of them require this proof, for example, or they require gravity, for example. Well, I think that's right, Peter, to some extent, but where it falls down is that some signatories to the convention do that, others don't do it. And if we are being asked to look at this convention and interpret it in a uniform way, it makes it very difficult to do that because what the CJU is saying is we're going to take those nations that require a particular standard of proof and a particular gravity and we're going to elevate their jurisprudence above the nations that don't require that. And although that might work in a European sense because the E27 are more inclined to um, interpret their own domestic case law in that way, there's lots of member states that actually just do not do that. Um, and I think it's very um, dangerous. And I, I think it's not intended to um, interpret the convention in such a way that it affects our procedural rules, for example, our laws of evidence. So, yeah, I think it is still problematic. I mean, I appreciate it wasn't supposed to get in the way of the development of jurisprudence. So I think it left it open so that if there was an international consensus that there had to be a particular gravity, for example, um, I don't think it would be as problematic, but there is not yet such an international consensus. So I think it's, we might be able to compromise on it being premature as a decision and thus wrong at the moment, but possibly as jurisprudence develops, it may become right. But I, I still think, um, because there's no international consensus on that, I still think it's probably wrong. Um, Alex asked a very good question. Is it fair to say that CJAU cases on the convention are likely not to be particularly highly regarded in England in the future due to their almost complete lack of reasoning by common law standards? Um, this was a point raised in our fern. Yes, it was. Um, and we will address that. Nina will be talking about our fern and what our fern says about um, decisions of the CJAU. And I am um, emboldened in my criticism of the CJAU, not that I need to be, but I am emboldened um, to say that I think that this wouldn't be followed by what happened in our firm. Uh, but we will come to that later, no spoilers. So um, that is where we are with bodily injury. We've got a decision in Lord of Motion which suggests that it may be recoverable, but you have to go through certain evidential hoops. Um, but I think it would be a brave person um, who took it to trial. But, you know, we we will get them taken to trial and we will find out what the answer is. Uh, now, in relation to turbulence, entirely different question. Um, again, there are cases that go both ways in relation to turbulence. It's a real hot topic at the moment because um, it's been 
well, you find that once these things are publicized in the news once, you get sort of half a dozen of them in a rash. Um, and turbulence can constitute an accident with meaning of the convention if it is unusual and unexpected because um, the meaning of accident under the convention, as you all know, is an event which is unusual and unexpected. Um, there are quite a lot of Canadian and American authorities on this. So light or moderate turbulence can't constitute an accident. Um, and, but there is this case, Liberia Linnaeus, um, and some of the Canadian authorities, which say that severe turbulence can be an accident. So the thinking behind this, I think, is that light and moderate turbulence is something that's only to be expected on a flight. It's just one of the usual operations of operating a flight. Severe turbulence, however, is um, something that comes out of the norm. Almost by definition, it's out of the norm. And there is a chart um, in that authority which shows you the meaning of um, light, moderate and severe turbulence. And once you get to the severe turbulence stage, um, it's an accident or it can be an accident. Um, again, I think one of the problems with that is that severe turbulence is one of those things that happens under the normal operation of an aircraft. Um, it's not perhaps um, unusual or unexpected in certain parts of the world or in certain flying conditions. And it depends what you mean by unusual or unexpected because um, it may be that on this particular day, going through this particular area, severe turbulence might be foreseeable. But there is no room for foreseeability as a concept in the convention. So that is where we are with turbulence. It can be an accident, um, but whether or not you're going to get above the limitation under Article 21 is perhaps another question. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the, the examples of what can constitute an accident, but it's going to be very fact um, specific, as indeed all of these things are. Nina, you've got thoughts on other accidents. <laughs> Yeah, four different cases here with different facts which address what an accident is or isn't under the convention. Um, so we'll have a look at these four and then there's two more that we'll just look at, including Arthur. So the first is Ford, which involves the act of giving a passenger an injection, which exacerbated a problem that she had. And this was determined that it didn't constitute an accident under the convention. So in this case, the claimant here, she didn't have her medication on board the flight and she was told that there was a doctor on board. The doctor administered the injection with the claimant's permission and the claimant submitted that the injection was an unusual event or happening which then caused the exacerbation of her condition and, and the ongoing discomfort for her. Now, the defendant argued that the key issue was the nature of the event and that it actually wasn't unusual and also it wasn't made unusual by the fact that the injection wasn't successful in dealing with the claimant's condition. And there was reference to a distinction between an event which was unexpected and one which was unusual. So the key question here was whether the actual act of giving the claimant an injection in the circumstances could be characterised as an unusual event from the claimant's perspective and actually whether the unusual nature of that event was a cause leading to the bodily injury. And the circumstances in which the injection was administered couldn't be characterised as unusual for the purposes of Article 17.1. There was no evidence that the administration of the injection was done in an abnormal way. In fact, the only unusual aspect of it was that it was carried out on an international flight by a passenger doctor. So there was no evidence that any of those characteristics had any causative effects in the chain of events that led to the claimant's bodily injury. So essentially the same chain of events would have taken place wherever the injection had been administered so that wasn't an accident but if you look at the case of Alitalia which involves a failure to follow protocols different circumstances completely in this case the passenger fell head first from the disembarkation stairs of the aeroplane and it was during poor weather conditions and the issue was whether fall was an accident under the convention now, the claimant submitted that the use of uncovered steps in snow was unusual and that the event wasn't a state of affairs, but more an active decision to use the uncovered stairs without checking for dangers. So essentially not to cover the stairs was a combination of acts and omissions. So this event was unexpected, unforeseen and external to the passenger. And it was held that that was 
evidence. In the case of GN and ZU, this involved a different question relating to the word accident under the convention. And in this case, the claimant had been served a hot cup of coffee, which was placed on the tray in front and it, it tipped over which caused second degree scalding it couldn't be established what caused the cup to fall and whether it was a defective tray or, or turbulence or other reason but the question of accident here was whether it included all situations occurring on an aircraft with, when an object was used rather than it being a hazard typically associated with aviation so the ECJ ruled that the convention wasn't limited to hazards associated with aviation and it referred to Article 17.1 and that the accident must have occurred on board an aircraft or in connection with embarkation or disembarkation. So again, it's clearly looking at what the language of the convention says. And in the case of Wuchner, this is the case of the claimant slipped on Baileys, which had been dropped by another passenger. And Mr. Wuchner slipped whilst he was making his way to the boarding gate to catch his flight. And in this case, the defendant admitted the accident circumstances, but stated that it was due to the negligence of the person who spilled the Baileys or it was actually the claimant's own carelessness. So it was agreed that the incident was an accident within the meaning of the convention and that the defendant would be liable to the claimant. It was also agreed that defendant was entitled to limit its liability pursuant to Article 20 of the Convention if it could prove on the balance of probabilities that the accident was wholly or partially caused by the claimant himself. So the accident was agreed in this case and we'll talk more about the contributory point shortly but the next case of Arthur Oh no, Austrian Airlines, sorry, skipping ahead. Keeping you on your toes, Sarah. <laughs> um, this involved a claimant who was disembarking a flight using a mobile stairway. There were handrails, but the claimant had a handbag, handbag in one hand and she was holding her two-year-old son in the other. So she wasn't holding the handrails and she fell. And the Austrian District Court dismissed this claim based on the fact that the defendant hadn't breached its obligations and the stairway didn't have any defects. And the claimant appealed and the CJEU held that the aim of the convention is to create strict liability. So the fact there was no fault by the carrier didn't mean that it wasn't an accident. So where a passenger falls for a no, no discernible reason, this could qualify as an accident and a claim under the Article 17 of the convention may succeed. However, it was also determined in that case that the carrier could rely on Article 20 with regards to contributory negligence and that the passenger wasn't holding the handrail off the stairway because she had her hands full. So Article 20 of the convention is interpreted as meaning that where an accident causing injury consists of a fall of the passenger for no ascertainable reason, the carrier may be exonerated from its liability towards that passenger, but only to the extent that taking account of all the circumstances in which that damage occurred, that the carrier proves that the damage suffered by the passenger was caused or contributed by the negligent or wrongful act or omission of that passenger. So essentially, if the airline alleges contributory negligence, it has to prove in what way the passenger negligently caused or contributed to the accident. And then we move on to the case of Arthur. And this claim rose from an injury suffered by Mr. Arthur when he fell to the floor on board a Ryanair flight. And he contended that this was an accident under Article 17, but the claim was dismissed. And the judge in this case found that Mr. Arthur had slipped on liquid that was a mixture of de-icer and water, which had made its way into the cabin on the shoes of the other passengers. And it was held that this wasn't unusual or unexpected for aeroplanes to be de-iced before travel. And therefore, it wasn't unusual or unexpected for the fluid to be present on the tarmac and then brought into the cabin on the shoes of others. So the appeal was dis dismissed. But it was held that the injury hadn't been caused by an unusual or unexpected event from the view of reasonable and objective passenger. And the court also confirmed that the ordinary reasonable passenger had to be regarded as a person with experience of commercial air travel and with reasonable knowledge 
of established or common airline practice. So it's not a subjective test. So it was held here that this wasn't an accident. And I think, Sarah, unless you have anything to add, you're going to talk about contributing negligence in a little more detail. Yeah, I mean, I just wrote something about our firm because Alex um, Cornelius made quite, quite a good point earlier, which was that in our firm, um, the judge was referred to the JR decision because it had just come out effectively. Um, and it was suggested to the judge, well, look, this is a bit like JR um, because the passenger's fallen. If, if, if he had fallen for no discernible reason, you would, he would succeed. Um, and therefore you should be inclining towards him succeeding. Um, and the judge, I think it was Collins Rice, if memory serves, might not have been, um, was very, very sniffy about the case of JR. And it's sort of, some of that made its way into the judgment, not all of it. Um, but the judge says that JR is actually just not very persuasive because it's not very um, extensively reasoned and it doesn't refer to um, the whole chain of international case law and only just cherry picks one or two. Um, and I think that the, that is, the, the judgment in our firm is actually an indication of how the English judges are likely to approach um, the decision in JR. We've got a question on JR, which is not, does it not, or on our fern rather, does it not seem the judges at both levels disregarded the actual evidence in our fern? It wasn't unexpected for some water to be in the cabin, but if there was some, it dried up very quickly. The evidence was it was a very large amount of water and it did not dry like it normally does. So the answer to that was that the reason the water didn't dry in the way that it usually does was that it was mixed with de-icer. Um, so it was kind of a sort of greasy sort of residue um, and the court found that it wasn't unusual for de-ice to be used in that kind of weather. And if it wasn't unusual for de-ice to be used in that kind of weather, it wouldn't be unusual for it to make its way into the cabin. Now, you may have views on whether or not that is right or not, but that was the finding of the judge at first instance. And the appeal court judge was, didn't feel that she was able to depart from it. Um, so she... Um, I was actually involved in Arthur, and we did challenge the factual findings. But the judge said, well, I'm not prepared to disturb them. Um, but yeah, I think that they're, with another judge on a different day, the claim in our firm would have succeeded because it does seem to me that our firm goes against the grain when it comes to accident. Um, and in particular, when you look at JR, they're not consistent at all. Um, but the judge in our firm was not prepared to follow um, JL or indicated that she wouldn't have been prepared to follow our firm. And I think there is a um, ideological shift now in judges. This is a more general point, perhaps. But there is an ideological shift with judges now where they are much more prepared um, to move away from following decisions of the CJEU. Um, we've had Lipton yesterday, um, which tells us how the court should be um, approaching decisions of the CJEU, and it's quite clear that they're not going to follow them if they don't like them, um, which is going to, we're, we're going to diverge, whether you like it or not, we're going to diverge from the rest of the EU um, when it comes to these type of interpretive questions. And of course, with the convention, perhaps that's unsurprising, because we, we have always tended to look to North America when it comes to interpretation of the convention. So, you know, there is more justification in relation to that than there is in perhaps other consumer um, context. But yeah, our firm is, a, is an unhappy case from a claimant's point of view, um, because it's it's probably the nadir of, of what a judge is going to find uh, is an accident. But there it is. Um, the claim failed at both first instance and on appeal. So turning now to contributory negligence, which was the question in Wuchner, um, and how that plays out um, in the context of other parts uh, of the uh, convention. There is a provision on con uh, contributory negligence um, in the convention. So the carrier must prove, and this is what Nina was talking about in relation to, um, to JR, the carrier must prove, so we know something about the evidential burden there, the damage was caused or contributed to by negligence or other wrongful act or omission of the person claiming compensation. And that is either a whole or partial exoneration from liability. Now, that, as Nina said earlier on um, in our talk, is governed by English notions of negligence. So because there's no determination or no interpretation of um, negligence in the convention itself, 
you look at what would be negligent within um, the, the, the applicable law. And what the applicable law is is outside the scope of this um, decanar, but um, certainly in Wuchner, the applicable there's no question as to what the applicable law was because the accident happened in England, the claim was being brought in England. There is a question as to applicable law under the convention as to whether or not it should be the law of the forum um, or the contractual applicable law or the tortious applicable law, but it actually didn't matter for those purposes. There is some case law, which is a Master McLeod case, um, which says that it's the contractual applicable law, which I'm not sure I agree with, actually. But in any event, um, the national concepts, so domestic concepts, do come into the convention insofar as interpretation of what is negligence um, is governed by domestic law or whatever the applicable law might be, whatever the court finds it to be. But nevertheless, if the carrier proves that the claimant was negligent, um, that can give rise either to partial or to wholesale exoneration. So contrary to what the English common law um, position used to be, you can have a total exoneration under Article 20. There's then Article 21, which also limits um, the carrier's liability. Um, and it's about £120,000, it's actually more so a special draw rights, that's the old convention, um, it's 113 odds. For each passenger, the carrier is not uh, able to exclude or limit its liability up until about £120,000, but it can limit its liability over that, um, that amount, £120,000 as it now is, if it proves that the damage wasn't due to the negligence uh, of the carrier, its servants or agents, or that the damage was solely due to the negligence or other wrongful act or omission of a third party. So effectively, the carrier's got two outs. First of all, if it proves that the claimant has contributed um, or is wholly responsible for um, the damage, then it reduces the claimant's damages figure by whatever that contribution is. Secondly, under Article 21, it's going to be liable up to the limit of about £120,000. But above that, it's not going to be liable if it shows that the damage was not due to its negligence or that it was solely due to the negligence of another party. But there's a tension there. <laughs> there is, and it looks quite straightforward, but... It is quite a complex idea to consider and it hasn't really been considered in huge amounts of detail in any reported authority. There's some academic commentary, but essentially it breaks down to what you see in the slide. Do you calculate the damages first and then reduce it to account for contributory negligence and then apply the cap under the convention or do you apply the cap first and then reduce it to account for the contributory negligence. And this was addressed in the case of Wuchner and is on a Judge Saunders looked at this and his answer was to look at it logically and look at the primary source. So he looked at the specific order of the provisions in the convention and stated that the articles don't impose a restriction to limit the claimant. So any deduction should be made from the total, not the total subject to the limitation. So you calculate the damages first and then you reduce it to account for contributory negligence and then you apply the cap. As a result, if a claimant is partly to blame for an accident, there's still a possibility that they can still claim the full cap sum under the convention. Yeah, and that can be quite important. I mean, it, it's the defendant in Wuchner was arguing that you applied the cap first and then contributory negligence. So you would say, OK, we're liable up to £120,000, um, let's say, and the claimant's been 50% contributory negligent, and therefore we're only liable for £60,000. Um, and that argument was rejected. So we know that Mr Wook now, now is going to recover at least up to 120000 and then whatever more there may be, and then with the reduction, I think it was 20 30% for good trip, the judge found in Wook now. 20 um, yeah. 20. Oh, good. Um, so, 
<laughs> so that that's the answer to that. But there's lots of um, there's lots of uh, academic commentary on it. No higher authority, and none of the academic. Um, there's there was one um, Dreon, I think, um, academic who found it really easy to mm-hmm. say, "We'll calculate damages, <laughs> reduce, and then apply the cap." But most of the other commentators are saying, actually, this is quite a difficult question as to whether you apply the cap first and then reduce, because it seems odd that a person who has contributed to the accident might recover damages up to the cap. Um, but there it is. That's that's the result in Wuchner. Um, likely, I think, to be followed because it's, you know, unlike the some of the European cases that I've been so sniffy about, it is actually completely well-reasoned, sets out the um, authority such that it is, sets out the convention itself and then sets out the academic commentary so it's a it's a complete answer for the moment um, and provides us with some resolution uh, of that tension now as regards limitation exoneration um, we were asked to provide some examples of situations in which the air carrier might be able to say well look we've not done anything wrong um, and we were asked the question at the beginning of this webinar, look, is there any situation now where you can actually, as a carrier, you can escape liability? Will there ever be a situation where you can prove the things that you need to prove? So you need to prove either claim and contrib, but OK, fine, we understand that. That's you know English concepts come into play, showing that the claimant has contributed to the accident wholly or, or, or partially. That's something we understand. But Article 21.2, these questions of can you prove A or B, can you ever prove A or B as a carrier? Well, A, you need to prove it, we weren't negligent, we did nothing wrong. B, you need to prove it was solely due to somebody else. It wasn't us at all. Um, There's been a very recent case in relation to the shooting down of an aircraft in relation to terrorist acts. But you, I think the answer to the question is, yes, you can. You can, as a, a carrier, um, defend these cases. And some of these, um, these turbulence cases are actually quite a good example of it. Um, so we've got... Um, taking appropriate steps, switching on a warning light may be sufficient. That's a Warsaw Convention case. Um, importance of weather warnings. So where a weather warning shows no risk that the flight's going to be, uh, is going to be subject to turbulence and, and, and therefore the pilot doesn't put on a, a seatbelt light, for example, um, then there is no fault on the part of the carrier. Um, there's also negligence in relation to failing to fasten seatbelts seat tightly enough or getting up when you shouldn't do. In Chisholm and Beer, I think that's where the lady gets up and goes to the loo, even though the warning light's been switched on, the seatbelt warning light has been switched on. That was enough to say, look, we've done what we could um, to prevent the accident. So there is still an ability to, to bring these defences um, and to say, well, look, we've done everything we could have done. But following Labardia, you need to follow protocol. That was the one where they didn't use covered steps in the snow. And following Wuchner, you need to have a, a policy that, that is adequate. So the oddity in Wuchner was that there was no policy for dealing with spillages at all, other than calling the cleaners. So the spillage could stay there for 15 minutes, and the carrier just didn't have a policy about that. It would just leave it there. So in order to show um, that you escape liability, I think a carrier has to show that it's got an adequate policy in place and that it follows that policy. But if it shows those two steps, but the accident nevertheless took place, um, you can es- establish the defence, I think. So, for example, in Wuchner, if the carrier had shown that there was a cleaning policy and that they followed it, and that nevertheless it just happened, the accident happened in the 30 seconds between the spillage um, and then then implementing the cleaning regime, um, the the defence would have been made out because they would have shown that they followed the policy in an appropriate way um, and that the accident wasn't due to their fault. And they would also have shown, of course, um, the second limb of Article 21.2, the B limb, that the accident was solely due to the negligence or other wrongful act or omission of a third party. And we had, during Wuchner, an ultimately sterile argument about whether you could ever show um, that the damage was solely due to the negligence or other wrongful act without also showing that it wasn't due to the negligence um, of a carrier. And it's actually quite hard to imagine a situation where you would show B but not A. 
So B looks like a bit of a dead letter to me. So as a carrier, you need to show um, you haven't been negligent. And not only that, your servants and agents haven't been negligent. And what is a servant or agent is a, an autonomous question uh, under the convention, which has been answered in a Scottish case called Mather, um, which again is outside the scope um, of this. But other defences which have succeeded pre-Montreal, so Warsaw Convention um, defences, um, extraordinary weather, which is unexpected, um, such as turbulence and electrical storms, might give you a defence. It's not going to give you a complete defence because it's going to be an accident, but it does give you a defence under Article 21 too. Criminal acts is a possibility, so where you show um, that the incident was solely due to a criminal act. The problem with criminal acts of third parties, so it looks as if you can come within um, Article 21 2B to say, well, look, it's a criminal act by, by a wrongful act of a third party. So the one that I'm thinking about is an American case, which involves um, a robbery. Um, that, in that case, the defence was, was brought to say, look, the, the robbery, the, the loss of the, of the cargo was only due to a wrongful act of a third party, of the robbers. That defence didn't succeed because the court said, well, it wasn't solely due to that, though, was it? Because if you'd had a proper um, burglar alarm system in place, this would never have happened. So you've got to bear in mind as a carrier that you might show a criminal act, but you've also got to show that there's nothing that you could have done to have prevented that criminal act or foreseen that criminal act. And this, I think, is where um, issues of foreseeability do come into play in the convention. Having said that issues of foreseeability don't come into play in Article 17, I think they do actually come into play in Article 21. Because if you've got an unusual and unexpected event, it's going to be an accident. So for example, um, a weather event that's unusual and unexpected, well, yeah, it's going to be an accident because that's one of the key things as to what an accident is under Article 17. But if it's unforeseeable by the carrier, can the carrier be said to be at fault? Certainly not under English domestic notions of um, negligence or wrongful act. So I think foreseeability is really going to come into focus um, when you're looking at those defences much more than it would come into focus in relation to Article, Article 17. So, yes, I think it is possible to make out these defences. I think Warsaw Convention um, jurisprudence on it is relevant, not completely because the articles are slightly different. Um, but there is scope to say the criminal act of a third party, which we could not have prevented or foreseen, and that's the important and difficult part, um, is going to bring you within Article um, 21 too. So I hope that that answers um, that question. It's not just a, if there's an accident, the payment succeeds. Um, in summary... Every case is fact sensitive, of course, and we've spoken about that um, earlier. The direction of travel, I think, favours claimants at the moment, both in relation to psychological injury and in relation to accident and in relation to Articles 20 and 21. Not following policies is going to be enough, I think, to establish liability under Labardia. Not having appropriate policies is going to be enough to establish fault under Wuchner, which seems intuitive. Um, and the big one, the big um, determination by Wuchner is that contributory negligence is considered prior to the application of the limit. So you don't limit and then reduce um, for contrib. Now, I think we've come to the end of our hour. We have. Um, if you've got any further questions, then please feel free to ask them. You can always email us afterwards and we'd be very happy um, to answer any questions that you may have. But it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Some great questions um, and some very good contributions. Um, it is not a straightforward convention um, to look at. And, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think it's quite a difficult convention to look at. Um, thank you, James. Um, and and it, it is difficult, particularly in relation to the um, bodily injury point and particularly in relation to accidents. Um, but I hope that helps. Um, Nina, thank you so much for coming along. It's been an absolute pleasure doing this with you, thank as you. indeed the Wuchner case was. Mm. And of course, with Wuchner, the case continues. Because, I was just going to say, yeah. yeah. 
Um, contrary to what you may have read in Daily Mail, because I know you're reading Daily Mail readers, um, Mr. Wookler, what, what seems to be reported in the Daily Mail rather oddly is that Mr. Wookler recovered £120,000 and then wanted to come back for some more, which um, <laughs> might have confused some of our English lawyers, given that we always tell our clients that when you settle, you can't come back for some more. Um, actually, what's happened in Wookler is that the defendant accepted liability up to the limits. And there is now going to be an almighty bun fight as to what happens next on Quantum. Um, but we had issue, we had uh, listed for trial of preliminary issues, which actually is another one of my top tips now that everyone's leaving, um, which is to deal with these questions of law under conventional preliminary issues because they're quite self-contained um, and your barrister will love you for it because dealing with um, questions of law in this way is something that barristers absolutely live for, unencumbered by things like evidence. <laughs> and the Montreal Convention is a really good example of it because, um, of course, it's not encumbered by issues of fairness either. So not only do you not have to think about, um, you don't have to think about things like facts, you don't have to think about fairness either because it gives rise to some completely unfair results. And actually in Wuchner, I remember the defendant's barrister saying, wouldn't it be surprising if we interpreted the, case, the, the convention in this way um, so as to, to apply the limit and then reduce for contrib? To which the answer was, yeah, but there's loads of things about the convention that are surprising, you know, and you just have to go with it. But it was a thoroughly enjoyable case though, Nina. It was. It continues. It continues. It continues. I actually feel very sorry for Mr. Wickler because he is um, a very unwilling um, guinea pig. Um, he's one of, one of those clients who simply doesn't understand why his barrister wants to be taking these things to try and argue these <laughs> really interesting points of law. He'd rather go straight to the session and negotiate with it, but there it is. Um, but yes, it's been super to have you. I will finish recording um, and stop the webinar, but have a lovely day all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sarah.